So we are discussing the topic of the three modes of material nature, three gunas. So what does anyone remember any points from what we discussed yesterday about the gunas? Sorry, anything? Gunas, uh, we saw there were three aspects. Three aspects. One was the building blocks, the pulling forces, and the third one, third one was the the sound. The, the, uh, the, uh, pre, uh, the pre the the pre the pre arranged paths or pre arranged choices. Pre arranged paths or choices. So yesterday this question was asked about references. Well there are no specific references to like the building blocks I gave the reference of 740. The idea is the world is the material nature, world is made of material nature is made of the Maya is made of the modes. Then forces, that is the words we decided yesterday. They are like ropes which bind. 14.5. So there are references now. This this idea of pre-arranged paths. This that it's not so much a matter of reference as it is a matter of inference. What do I mean by inference? It's the fact that it is said that certain places are in particular modes, or even certain activities, certain mentalities, they are in particular modes. What that means is that if this is the kind of behavior a person has or you associate with the person this kind of behavior that's the track on which you are going to go so in that sense that's a the, re, the idea that a forest like we discussed is largely in the mode of goodness or a library is in the mode of goodness so what that means is that in that area the path goes that way so it's an influence then we discussed about the three gunas and how each of them has its value. Sattva, Raja and Tamas. Raja is required for the maintenance of the world. And even Tamas is required, otherwise you won't have rest and rejuvenation. The problem is dominance by the modes. So now, with respect to the modes itself, Krishna in the Gita talks about the modes primarily in chapter 40. However, he also talks about the modes in chapter 17. And then in the first half of chapter 18, basically uh, around, he emphasizes the concept of the modes and he does analysis from text 20 to around text 40. There he's also talking about the modes and he's analyzing various components of action in terms of the modes. So we will, <clears throat> today in today's session, we'll try to look at some of, uh, draw things from each of these chapters to try to understand the concept of modes better. So, in this particular verse, now, in this particular verse, the effect of the modes is to be known. So, spirituality or generally the spiritual, spiritual can be known in broadly two ways. One is what is called as ontological or you could use the more familiar word structure and the other is functional ontological means what it is and functional is what it does so the idea is that in, in today's world especially that people are not really interested in so much what is the nature of reality there's a discussion about that but many people are interested in practicing meditation or mindfulness even mantra chanting because it benefits them and they want to make sense of how it benefits so people are interested in the functional side of things the ontological thing that what actually exists so actually in today's world scientifically speaking Proving the existence of the soul or proving the existence of God is quite difficult. We have some cases which we use for proving the existence of God. But none of that, none of that is really accepted by mainstream science. Not rejected, it's a case. But it's not a knockout case. There are many concerns about it. And slowly the evidence is piling up. 
But the point is, many people, they are not so much concerned. In fact, for them, whether the soul exists or not is not as important as if I do some spiritual meditation, how, how will it benefit? So people are more interested in the functional side of things. That's not a necessarily a good or bad thing, it's just the way things are like. So when we talk about the modes, Krishna also spends much more time in describing the modes in functional terms. So now what is the difference between say ontological and functional, like fire burns. So fire is the thing, burning is what it does. Now the two are related, Jiva Goswami gave this example in the Shatsandarvas, that fire is the thing, burning is its vishesh, its characteristic, its uh, feature, its guna. Now can there be fire that does not burn? Well, maybe we could say it might be hypothetically possible. Like we have hot light sources, cold, not so hot light sources, like bulbs and tube lights. So you could say, now is that really fire in the conventional sense? Can't really call it fire. It's basically illumination. So generally, it's very difficult for us to convey, conceive of fire without burning. Generally speaking. But the point is, the two are, while they are different, we primarily know there is fire through the burning sensation. So like that, there are modes, what they are and what they do. So the Gita also describes modes much more in functional terms. So generally, what it does. How do we know that? So Krishna describes the If you consider the modes and what it does, that means their effects. So he talks about it at four different levels. From 11 to 13, he will talk about the prominence, the presence and prominence. We are talking about the 14th chapter right now. That when a particular mode is present and prominent, what is the result? Then in 14, 15, and 16 verses or other let's make it shorter in uh, let's go over them one by one as we move forward so presence and prominence means and Krishna says how do we know which mode is prominent at a particular time so he says that with respect to Sattva Guna yesterday I mentioned one character of Sattva Guna did you remember what happens in Sattva Reflection. Reflection first, action later. Yes. The same thing Krishna says in a little more poetic terms. Sarva, let's recite this verse. Sarva dware shude hesmin. Sarva dware shude hesmin. Prakasha upajayate. Prakasha upajayate. Jnanam yada tada vidya. Jnanam yada tada vidya. Vivruddham sattva mityuta. Vivruddham sattva mityuta. So, sattva. When sattva is vivruddha, when sattva has become prominent, Krishna in the previous verse says, in the tenth verse, that the modes are constantly in competition. Ajas tamascha vibhuya. Sattvam bhavati bharata. Raja sattvam tamascha so we see that even in our own lives, say so right now you are sitting and hearing this class. Maybe a part of you wants to sit and study and understand these things. And another part of you may want to say, I have so many things to do. I have to do this and I have to do that. I hope this class will work out too long. I have things to do. Now it's not necessary. You, you may have even services to do, important things to do. But a part of us wants to be reflective, think, understand. A part of us wants to do things. Other part is, you know, I'm just had a long day, I'm tired, I just want to sleep, I'm getting to sleep. That are part of us. So there, there are these parts of us which are pulling us in different directions. So these are associated with the moods. And they are there and they are competing inside us. Now this competition also happens outside us. But we feel it most evidently inside us. Like if a meeting is going on, sometimes one person might be more Satvika, another person might be more Rajasik, another person might be more Tamasik. So, depending on who becomes more prominent, 
the meeting will go in a particular way. If Satvik person is there, we say, okay, let's we need to get maybe we need to get more information, we need to analyze more. Let's let's find out more about this. Let's find out more about that. That could be Satvik But our Joguna could be let's let's do this. But what about these things? Oh, don't be so don't be so pessimistic. Just let's do it. The person just like this. Some people make things happen. Some people watch things happen, and some people wonder what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so Satvaguna is not just lazy. Satvaguna is not just thinking. The thinking and acting. In the Amrut Mantan Leela, you know the, the Leela in which the milk portion has been churned. So at that time there was the rod which was being pulled by ropes. So on one side the pulling was under Devutas who were energized by Satvaguna. And on the other side the, the Asuras were energized by Rajoguna. And both of them were pulling. So, and they were able to pull, and they were able to churn. So, what it means is that Sattva and Rajas were having equal energy to balance. Sometimes people keep think that Indian Sattva you won't do much things. But they were one side was having Sattvic energy, the other was having Rajasic energy. So, they were both able to function. If, the, if churning is going on and one side is stronger than the other, then churning can't happen. It just get pulled in one direction. So the idea is, ultimately, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, it's these modes, Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, while they are associated with certain activities, that is there, but they are much more as associated with the mentality behind the activities. So the same activity can be done in Sattva, the same activity can be done in Rajas, the same activity can also be done in Tamas. So it's more a matter of our mentality or our consciousness. What is the level of our consciousness when we are doing the activities? So when Krishna does give some classification, but it is, it is not necessarily a black and white classification. In the 17th chapter, Krishna talks about how tapasya can also be the sattva rajas tamas. So it depends on why a person is doing something. So, how do we know? See, it this struck me when I was in college. You know, I, when I was in Nasik, I was among the, I was the, the best student in my class. But when I came to Pune for engineering, uh, bright students from all over India. I was still among the better students, but I was not the best student. I said, I really have to work very hard and compete. And I, I was quite interested in the, you could say the analytical, not so much philosophical, I didn't know philosophy, but I was really interested in the analytical side of things. Understanding concepts, trying to study and learn for the joy of learning. And then, so we had uh, an exam, I came second. The one boy came first and he was very happy. So I went to congratulate him. He says, Today I'm so happy. He says, Yeah, you came first. He said, No. He said, This girl whom I was trying to propose, she's agreed to come with me on my bike before I come first. So for him, coming first was just a means to the end. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, study is a Santu activity, you could say, relatively speaking. But why was he studying? Not so much because he was interested in the subject. It was that somebody impress, he could impress a girl. So you could say that the activity is determined not just by what is the activity, but why a person is doing the activity also. So the sattva rajas tamas in terms of ultimately the mentality. Now that's why Krishna is saying that the verse which is Sarvadvare Shudehe Smin Prakashupachayate. Prakash means illumination, light. Now, what are the doors of the body? What does it mean? Does the body have any doors? What does it refer to? Yeah, the senses. Now, what does it mean? Sattva guna, person Sattva guna, light comes out of his ears, light comes out of his nose, nostrils. Now, here, see the Gita is poetry. It is Bhagavad Gita, the song of God. And poetry means there are poetic ornaments. 
there is non-literal usage repeatedly in the Bhagavad Gita. So once it's non-literal usage, it's prakasha is not just light coming out. It is like say, it is a dark room and there's a door. And if the whole room is dark, then who comes in and who goes out? No one will know. Say if this class was had completely darkness, then we would not know who is sitting in the class, who is not sitting in the class. It would go out. Of course, you would know if the speaker went out, the sound will go out. <laughs> but, say, a thief could come in, somebody could sneak out, but at the door, there is a light. Then what will happen, we will notice who is coming in. And if we see a suspicious looking person coming in, we will immediately go and stop that person. We will just ask them, who are you, what do you want, why have you come here? And if say there's a child in the home and a child is going out to play on the streets, the child might get in danger. So the child going out will stop the child. So like that, basically, when it is said, the doors of the body, they are illuminated. What that means is that we are able to see and decide what comes in and what goes out. So a Rajasic person or a Tamasic person, they may speak things that they don't mean, that they don't even think, and they speak. You know, some people think and speak. Others speak and then think. <laughs> Actually, other speak still don't, they don't think, they only make others think. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> they, what they have said, nobody can make sense of. There was one author, he used to write very complicated uh, passages. So, one says one of his poems won an award. Uh, the, uh, the committee was supposed to give an award, they said, it's a very good quote composition, but what does this mean? Can you explain? So, he looked at it once, he looked at it twice, he looked at it thrice. And then he said, so when I wrote it, God and I knew what it meant. Now only God knows. <laughs> so, the point is that sometimes people, they're just not conscious of what they're doing. Sometimes it could be creativity and inspiration, but sometimes just recklessness, thoughtlessness. So, what comes out, people may not be aware. Or what goes in, people are indiscriminate in eating food sometimes. Some people treat their tongue like a conveyor belt. <laughs> Anything that they find, all kinds of luggage goes down their tongue. <laughs> so that is lack of discernment. So when Krishna is talking about doors are illuminated, what that means is there is a sense of discernment. Now discernment is the same as the more politer word nowadays for discrimination. The word discrimination has nowadays got a very negative connotation. A caste discrimination, racial discrimination, gender discrimination. So, discernment is a politer word for that. Discernment is to differentiate. So, Satyagoda is characterized by that awareness. Okay, these kind of thoughts are coming inside me, these kind of. So, somebody is talking. And sometimes the conversation may start off as constructive, but then the other person starts gossiping. And sometimes you don't even realize they're gossiping, and we also keep gossiping. And keep gossiping, keep gossiping, and then after some time, you know, so much garbage I got into my head. Why did I waste so much time? So, if that discernment is there, it's suddenly the conversation starts going toward gossip. You just say, no, I don't want to, can't talk about something else, I don't want to talk about the subject. Or we can just excuse ourselves and go away from there. Or if you're in a position of authority, we may tell that person, just, no, not talk about it, like, whatever. But there's that sense of discernment. So, that's the characteristics of the there is many different characters, but this is one of them. Now, after this, Krishna is a characteristic of Prajyoga. That he says, let's look at that verse. Lobha pravritir arambha Lobha pravritir arambha Karmanama shamas pruha Karmanama shamas pruha Prajasye tani jayante Prajasye tani jayante so, Lobhava Pravutti Rāgana. 
that Lobha is what? Greed. But more, more, more. Krishna said this is the primary characteristic. And then pravritti means it's you can say nature, disposition. So it is now it is good to act according to our particular disposition. But even there we have to be balanced. See, in any particular activity that we do, say somebody likes uh, music. Now yes, they need to do music, but they also have to look at their relationships, and their health, the other aspects of their life. Somebody cannot become manic about that. Somebody likes sports. The sports is good. But sometimes in practicing sport, that becomes a mania for them. And then they are just completely alone. And uh, this is where, when there's only pravritti, this will what lead to what is today called as workaholism. Alcoholism is where a person is intoxicated with alcohol. Alcoholism is where a person is intoxicated by work. And his work becomes their way of escaping. They have issues with their family, they have issues with their own mind. But, so dealing with those issues, they use their work to escape. So workaholism has been called as the prestigious addiction. And normally from India, the addiction, the person is looked down upon. Oh, somebody is alcoholic, drug addict. But somebody is workaholic, oh, you know, work so hard. You're not, I have not taken a single leave in the last 20 years. Okay, I am always the first to come in the office and the last to leave from office. So, if you put it more politely, a workaholic is a Buddha. What <laughs> the <laughs> Now certainly the Gita is not recommending laziness. But it is disproportionate obsession something. That arambha karmana. That means this person keeps starting newer and newer things. So these people are very good at starting new projects but not completing them. So people make new year resolutions, isn't it? Like it's good to make resolutions. But then what happens is they make the, maybe some people make there's a new resolution resolutions. At the start, on January 1 and by January 30, not only they give up the resolutions, they have even forgotten the resolutions. It's like the, something new comes up, something new comes up, karmana, arambha, keeps trying new things, new things. So then, ashamaha spruha. Every spruha is desire. So everyone has desires. But there are ashamaha, insatiable desires. And that's where it becomes a problem. Not all desires are naturally insatiable. Like say somebody, somebody gets a desire to eat some halwa. Okay, you cook some halwa and my wife cook you eat it. It's not necessary that just because somebody liked halwa once, they will become a halwa addict. <laughs> every meal they want to eat halwa only. And not only every meal they want halwa, they want every meal to be only halwa. <laughs> that doesn't happen. So, generally it is not that people, that every single desire becomes addictive or compulsive. But some desires do become like that. So, Kashamaspa is just insatiable desire. Now, to some extent, insatiable desire doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a desire that is intrinsically addictive, but it can become addictive. When it becomes addictive, it becomes very destructive. So, now generally, having desires is a characteristic of Rajoguna. But being completely conquered, controlled by desire, addicted, that is generally a character of Tamoguna. So, but Ashamahaskura. And Krishna says, Rajasya Ekan Jayate. That, this is the characteristic of Rajoguna. When Rajoguna is Vivruddhi, when Rajoguna becomes prominent, these are the characteristics. So, what are the characteristics of Rajas? You can say there are broadly four characteristics. One is more. I want more. That's one thing. Now, many people may want more, but here the thing is they are ready to work more, but it's work too much. That is workaholism. And the thing is, okay, I want something, I work for it, I get it sober. No. What happens is, they work too much, but they keep, they, they 
is like jump to new things. Take one thing and stick to it and achieve something in it. So Rajaguna, if it is not slightly having some Sattvaguna with it, a person cannot stick to one area. Now, nowadays for people to change jobs is quite natural. And it's okay, as long as you get a better job, then you can earn more, and then you can uh, have a greater leverage in negotiating with your boss. And if you have some other job available, then you can ask for better working conditions, more pay or whatever. That's fair enough. But if a person is constantly changing, 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 and then that might make them very restless. So if it is thoughtfully done, strategically, that's fair enough. But it's just because a person is restless and that's not even good. And then finally, it is insatiable desire. So these four are the result of Vajuna. Desire is natural, but insatiable desire. So that's where, uh, now if you consider these things, we'll see Rajoguna is quite common in this world. It's, it's very, very common. And uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur gives a fascinating analysis. He says, Sattva Guna, in Sattva Guna, the knowledge acquiring senses are more active. In Rajoguna, the working senses are more active. We have different senses. In Sattva Guna, a person is alert taking information to gather understanding. In Rajoguna, what happens? The working sense, I have to do things. So he says that in, if you consider the Western, West versus the East, East means broadly India, he said in, in both, everybody wants progress in life. But in the West, progress is defined more in terms of karmendriyas. That what do you do? Whereas in the East, it is more in terms of jnanendriyas. And that's why in India, philosophy was highly developed. Philosophy is perceiving and understanding. In the West, technology was more developed. Now, technology is about changing things in the world. So, now in technology also, to develop technology also, Gyanendriyas are involved. But the primary thing is Karmendriyas. What do you do? And these are different value systems that, so those who are into technology, they are not interested in knowledge for knowledge sake. They are concerned knowledge, okay, what changes it doing about? So Einstein said, science is a wonderful thing as long as you don't have to earn a living out of it. Because what happens as soon as you want to have, uh, have to earn a living out of it, then then financial interest coming. And then if a research is being done, if you want to accelerate the research, doctor the research so that the theory is proved right. And a lot of bad science happens. I'm not saying all science is bad. But that starts happening. So the idea is that it, progress is there in both modes. But it is there are different definitions of progress and success. Satoguna is more about understanding. Whereas Rajoguna is more about doing, executing, changing. Now, we'll come back to this difference a little later. But let's move on to Tamoguna. So, Krishna defines Tamoguna more in terms of what is not present. Like he says, Prakasha is the characteristic of Satoguna. Then pravritti is the characteristic of Rajog. So he starts by Aprakasho Apravrittisha Pramado Moha Evacha Tamasya Tani Jayante Vivrutte Kuru Nandana so, tamasyaitani. When the tamagura is more, these things become more. So, what are you describing? Pramada and moha. So, what is pramada? You know? 
badness and moha, illusion. So now, what is the difference between these are things? These are very interesting words. Let's look at. There is pramada. There is moha, and there is adhyan. Now, we consider. It's not moha. It's moha. So we see Krishna talks about it. Nash. Kachide tachu tampartha to eka grena chetasa kachi adhyana samoha pranashta ste dhananjaya. So adhyana and moha. So it says, has your ignorance and illusion been dispelled? So any thoughts about what is the difference between first adhyana and moha? Very good. Because of Ajnan, Moha can come. Because of Ajnan, Moha can come. But that still keeps us in Ajnan and Moha about what they mean. <laughs> it's true. It's true. So, yes? Ajnan means knowledge is not correct. And in case of Moha, knowledge may be present, but that person may be correct. Good point. Adhyana means I don't know. But it's pretty same. It's to Adhyana is to not know. Moha is to know falsely. Like say, if we are in the dark, we don't know what is ahead. So we are in Adhyana. But if we are seeing a mirage, then that is not Adhyana, that is Moha. Because illusion, illusion involves a form of perception, but the perception is wrong. Whereas Ajnana means there is no perception. I am not seeing anything at all. Now Pramada is to have certainty about false knowledge. It's like I am convinced that I am right. So, when Mantara persuaded Kaikai, at that time, did Kaikai go into Moha or Pramada? Well, you could say it could be either of those. But, when she was not ready to listen to anyone else, when Dashrath tried to beg to her, when Sumantra, the minister tried to talk with her, Vashishta tried to talk with her, she was not ready to listen to anyone. And she was convinced this is the truth, that the conspiracy to deprive my son of his kingdom. And I am working for his best interests. And everybody else is either too naive to understand the conspiracy, or everybody else is a part of the conspiracy. So that is what? Pramada. So, which is much more difficult to come out of? Pramada. So here, that's why, see, when we say the mode of ignorance or tamas. So actually, tamas includes all of these. Tamas is not just ignorance. Tamas is also false perception or it's also like conviction about false perception. There's a Western philosopher who said, the problem with the world is that the wise people are doubtful and the foolish people are super confident. <laughs> <laughs> so the wise people, you know, we say we may believe in God, but we always have God, does Krishna really exist? If I get into trouble, Krishna will really protect me. Will my heart really change? We have all these doubts. But a materialistic person, if I just can get to America, my life will be successful. Uh, if I can just marry this girl, my life will be successful. So I was, I was in a class in, uh, in Canada on the reincarnation. And after that, an Indian boy came. I have a very serious personal question. 
said, okay. So he said, you know, I'm in love with a girl. She also wants to be with me. We've been trying for years, but our parents are just not ready. It's not working. So he said, I want to know what can I do by which I can marry her in my next life. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Bollywood has all romanticized the idea of reincarnation. You may know the movies like Om Shanti Om and others, where the hero and the heroine die, and they come back in the same body. It's not reincarnation, it is like re-see incarnation. See, in the same incarnation they're coming back again. That doesn't happen. But the idea is, people think, Reincarnation is just a plot twist in a romance story. <laughs> so they're so convinced, if I can be this with this girl, that will be the success of my life. And they'll go to any ends for that. So this is more. Now, of course, uh, there has to be uh, bond in relationships. The bond itself is not more. But the idea that, that some person and being with some person will be the source of all happiness for me. That is a moha. And that moha can go to the level of pramada. And that's why when people, when they use the word break up, but there's nothing up, people break down. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the times. So it's like, people can just go mad sometimes. It's very difficult to recover if somebody is very invested in the relationship. So Tamasa involves all this thing. I don't know, I think I know, and I'm sure I know. And if you don't agree with me, it is you who don't know. So that is a that is Tamamuna. And people in Tamamuna, that's my darkest of Tamamuna. They're very difficult to bend. Because they're just so consumed by the certainty of their ideas. That, 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 it is as if for them, they, Krishna later on in the 18th chapter will talk about a concept of knowledge in ignorance. It is jnana in tamamuna. So, how can there be knowledge in ignorance? Knowledge and ignorance are opposite things. But that is where, if you use the word tamas, knowledge and ignorance are opposite. So what happens is, it's, so I'm normally say if I am here, then if my knowledge grows in all directions, then what happens is, the knowledge is growing like this. This is, I get a broader understanding of things. But suppose from here, my knowledge grows only in one direction. That means I'm getting knowledge like this. But I'm not getting any further knowledge. So it's like people have biases. Oh, you know, people from this particular community are foolish. From this particular people are very selfish. From this particular community they are very violent. From this people they are very manipulative and political. So now, yes, some people may be like that. But when there is knowledge in the mode of ignorance, we only look for evidence that supports that idea. And we may get more and more cases. Oh, these people are like this, these people are like this, these people are like this. But it could be that there are, there are millions of people and we find hundred cases of people who are like that. But then those hundred, what about the remaining million? No, I'm sure this is right. That's knowledge in the mode of ignorance. So that's why so it is knowledge, knowledge in Tamahona means one, it's not that a person is it's foolish. Okay, they are foolish, but they are using their intelligence to be foolish. They are using their intelligence to hold on to their foolish ideas. So this is the characters of Tamogona. And sometimes you think of Tamogona as just a person dysfunctional and useless. And yes, there is truth to that. But that is not the only way Tamogona works. Tamogona can work in many different ways. So after giving these characteristics, we'll go back to the words that we have recited. But before I do that, let's take another more effects. Sattva, Rajas, Tamas are 
are quite subtle in one sense. So, for example, there can be an atheist who can actually be living in Sattva. Now, Sattva, you may say, how is that possible? Well, atheism as a philosophy is ignorant. But the atheist lifestyle might be in Sattva. The atheist might be truthful, the atheist might be honest, the atheist might be environmentally conscious, the atheist might be helpful, the atheist might be charitable. It's possible that people, there can be good people, for whatever reason they may have become atheist. Maybe they had some bad experience with the religion. And I was in Texas. Texas is, I think I, I, I'm not mentioning this. You know, for Indians, we have a many, we think America is Hollywood. But America is a huge country. And there are lots of variety. So in fact, among all the countries in the Western world, America is the most religious country. Mm -hmm. the, the, the central and southern parts of America are quite Christian, evangelical Christian. You know, in Australia, I was in New Zealand. So the one of, I was talking with one person over there. He was, we talked about some time. He was asking me, where all do you travel? So I said, I spent about three, four months in America in a year. Oh, America? You know, it's filled with those religious nuts who elected Trump. So, for them, America is like a super religious country. England and, and it is true, in the Western world, America is the most religious country. Canada, England, France, they are highly atheistic. Western New Zealand also. But uh, anyway, what was I saying? So, I was in Texas and I saw a car, and the car had a bumper sticker. So, evangelicals are Christian preachers who are very aggressive and pushy. They, to, they force people to come to the church, force people to read the Bible, force people to become Christian basically. So there was this, this had a slogan on it, a quote, Oh God, please save me from your preachers. <laughs> <laughs> so the Christian idea is God saves us through his preachers. But the preachers are very judgmental, holier than thou, condescending, looking down at everyone. I say, I don't want to talk with these people. Please save me. So people may be atheistic because they've had a bad experience with religion. But overall their life might be sattvic. So it's not a simple state designation. So, so that's why when you're talking about the modes, the gunas, it's which guna a person is in may be very difficult to trim. Because a person may have a composite Say, a person's beliefs might be in tamas. But maybe their speech might be in sattva. Like there are some politicians who are very refined speakers. Not just eloquent, very polite and sweet and sweet and soothing kind of speakers. And that's not just an act. It's not just a mask that in public they speak like that. Even one to one dealings, they may be like that. But that does not mean that they are very soft and gentle. They may be in their actions, they might be very power hungry, greedy, manipulative. So that could be the poor rajas. So people could be a combination of things. I said, uh, somebody might be a meat eater. Now meat eating itself, we can say is a tamas activity. But that does not mean the entire person's character is tamas. Somebody might be a meat eater, but in other areas of their life, as I said, they might be kind, they will be charitable. But this is a blind spot, they don't understand they are killing animals for their food. We cannot define the mode of a person only by one particular activity. In fact, the Bhagavatam says, even religious people, even devotees, can be in sattva, rajas and tamas. You say, how devotees are transcendental. Yes, devotees have a transcendental goal. But, in terms of functionality, we all come from a particular background and we have a particular way of function. So, some, some may come from a sattvic background and that's how they continue on. Some may come from a rajasic background and may take some time to come, come to sattva. Somebody may come from a tamasic background and for them to come from sattva might seem like a huge mountain to climb. So, it's, we cannot just take one activity, you cannot just say that I am chanting so I am transcendental. Well, if you think you are transcendental, 
then people should beware of transgender people. <laughs> 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 uh, so we have an operational mode, so it's nuanced. Somebody might might be very sophisticated in terms of their language. They might be very advanced technology, but their whole world view might be very tamasic. There are many activists too. Uh, in India, it's not that much of an issue, but in the West, abortion is a very big issue. There is in America, as well, there's a pro-choice lobby and pro-life law. Pro-choice, they feel that the woman should have the choice. Nobody else should enter here. It is the woman's choice. Society has nothing to do with it. But pro-life is, they say, it's not a woman's issue. It's a humanity's issue because it's a human child that is there in the womb. So, life should be emphasized. So either way, I initially I thought people who didn't support abortion don't understand that actually it's killing a child. But over a period of time, there is a sort of knowledge in the mode of ignorance or even intelligence in the mode of ignorance, Krishna Bhakti Vedi chapter, people have such perverted ideas. So in the West, where feminism has become very aggressive, now, feminism itself has had many generations. First, it was that women should at least be allowed to inherit property. Women should have custody rights for their children. That is the first generation feminism. Then women should be allowed to do jobs which they can do. That is the second generation feminism. Then women should be able to do all kinds of jobs. Should be allowed to do all kinds of jobs. That is third generation. Fourth generation is women are better than men at everything. And all the problems in the world are because men are in power. If men just become humble and start listening to women, all the problems in the world will be solved. So this is a fourth generation feminism and this is quite toxic. So now here what has happened is, women are educated or miseducated to actually think that marriage and motherhood are all traps. And you cannot, you, men don't want you to grow in careers and that's why they get you to have children and then you are stuck at home. So, you know, traditionally in society, if a woman does not have a child, it's a sad thing. If a couple does not have a child, it's a sad thing. But for a woman, it's especially very destabilizing. Women have a natural nurturing nature. See, everybody has different needs. One of the big needs we have is the need to be needed. We all have a need to be needed that my existence matters to someone other than me. My existence is vitally important for someone else. And that need to be needed is addressed by becoming a parent. And while everyone has that need, women have that nurturing need a lot more than that. So normally somebody will say, oh, he's a, he's a, he's a childless woman. But in the West, they have the idea, I'm not a childless woman. I'm a child-free woman. You know, as a, a child is a burden or a bondage. But thank goodness your mother didn't think like that. <laughs> is it? <laughs> Otherwise you wouldn't be there. But this idea, it has gone to such a level that Prabhupada would say that if, uh, if there is unrestricted male-female union, then what happens is the woman becomes pregnant and the man goes away. And the woman has to Beer has to beg to the state for support, or the woman becomes uh, very troubled. Parenting is a full time job for two parents. A single parent, those who do it, it's very, very difficult. But so the thing is, the at least to a certain extent, the burden of procreation falls disproportionately on women. A man just has one time intelligence, and a woman may become pregnant if she becomes pregnant for eight, nine months. So what the tamasic, not the sattvic understanding of this is that okay, we should become responsive. Uh, that the sexual indulgence should be the responsible dharmic relationship for raising children. So that's the sattvic understanding. The rajasic understanding is that you try to sneak in and try to do something and that you hope that there's no pregnancy. And then people want to enjoy without responsibility. But tamasic idea over here is 
that nature itself is unfair to women. That why do why are men allowed to get away by having sex and women are not allowed to get away? Nature is unfair. So there is this whole book, not a whole book, whole books written on this topic. How pregnancy is biological slavery for women, and abortion is technological liberation. So that's why their idea is abortion is a fundamental right for women. And what nature has created as trouble for us, the technology of abortion is the freedom from that trouble. And that's why you know, on Facebook and Instagram in the rest of the world, there is, it's like we may tell stories of how I came to Krishna consciousness. So women told us stories how I did a abortion. It's leave alone being something we are embarrassed about. Kill the child. This is how I did my abortion. The whole society was condemning, but I don't care for society. So this is Tamoguna gone down to the level of, of you could say ideology. So in this ideology, what happens is they say that womanhood is completely separate from motherhood. That to equate womanhood with motherhood is just to trap a woman into one role and take away her woman. That's why in the West, and even westernized women don't like this address, Mataji. They say, you are restricting us to a particular role in the life. That's what my one devotee, Mataji, she's not a feminist, but she's quite aggressive. She says, if anybody calls you Mataji, I won't call you Pitaji. <laughs> so now, to say, now, the, but the problem is that, uh, that many women, they may pursue their careers, but actually women are very much more relational than men. Even with this complete autonomy, women will choose careers where they can interact more with people. You know, generally men go into engineering much more. Okay? Men go, women go more into medicine, more women go more into nursing, women go more into uh, occupations where they can interact with people. So everybody needs relationships, but that relational need is much more in women. And by the age of 35, 40, 45, many of these women are profoundly unhappy because they prioritize the career over their over marriage and having children. They become very lonely and they have a lot of mental health problems. So the thing is that we're not blaming women over here. I'm just giving this as an example of knowledge in the mode of ignorance and intelligence in the mode of ignorance. There, what is a traditional conventional understanding is completely perverted. It's completely perverted. And there are always cynical women who, not, not cynical women, cynical men. There are always men who are manipulative cynical who exploit these things. So women have these tendencies and uh, if, if women start believing these things, men start exploiting them. And the result of it is complete chaos in society. So in the West there was in 1960s round about, 1940-50 started, and just second world war. What they call it the sexual revolution. Sexual revolution is the idea that all traditional standards of sexual restraint are, are not just old-fashioned, but they are, they are bad. They are bad and they should be given up. They should be rejected. So, Tamoguna has become very, very dark. Now, people want relationships, but people also want to enjoy. So now, when I just come to the two points about how Tamoguna has become so dark. That Tamoguna takes, Tamoguna is not just inactivity. Tamoguna can be very intellectually done, destructive activity. So now in the West, there is this whole concept of open marriage. What is the idea of open marriage? that the husband and the wife, they say, you know, you can see other people. The husband can have physical relationship with other women, the wife can have other relationship, physical relationship with other women. Well, then what is the point of marriage? Oh, we are married. Both of them agree to each other and it just, the marriage becomes very hollow. There's one American comedian who said that, look, my wife and I, we drive in different cars, we eat at different tables, 
we watch different TVs, we live in different rooms, we are doing everything possible to keep our marriage together. <laughs> <laughs> what is left of that marriage, isn't it? <laughs> so, I just become a completely hollow thing. And Tamoguna, in that sense, is extremely dark and mystic. So, so Tamoguna is not just unintelligent. It can use intelligence for a destructive purpose. So Tamoguna is associated with destruction. So that's why I said, we talked earlier about these things. Tamoguna, there's pramad, madness. Madness doesn't have to be just like momentary madness. Person gets angry and gets bewildered. It can almost be like permanent madness where it's ideologically justified. Now, even the, so the second point I'll make, will I conclude is that the Bhagavatam says religion can also be tamas. So when we talk about fanaticism, fanaticism, Krishna defines knowledge in ignorance, knowledge in tamas. What does he say? He gives many things about it, but they seem to make one thing into everything. So, yattu kutsnavat ekasmin. One thing into everything. So, like with respect to, I talked about the whole abortion thing, that a woman's right to have free sexual indulgence the way man can have. Well, nobody can have it free, everybody has consequences eventually. But, if that is the most important thing, then everything coming in the way is a barrier. Now the capacity of a woman to bear a child is not a parent, it's a gift, it's a privilege. It's a special privilege given to human nature only to women, not to men. But that is still is honest. So like when somebody takes one thing and makes it into everything, that is the Mogura. That is the characteristic of knowledge in the mode of ignorance, in the Mogura. So this is also the characteristic of fanaticism. Fanaticism means what basically? That what works for me. Say so this works for me. What works for me is the only thing that can work for anyone. So if worshipping this particular God in this particular way is what works for me, that is the only thing that can work for anyone. And if anybody else is doing anything different, then those people are foolish. Those people are evil. evil. So, once a person on in Los Angeles, was in the well-known bridge, and in the past from that bridge, people would jump down and commit suicide. So, there's one person standing on that bridge, about to jump off. And another person got me, hey, please don't jump off. He said, why? Why do you want to end your life? He said, nobody cares for me, nobody loves me, nobody will bother me, nobody will even know if I exist or die. This person walking by saying, but Jesus loves you. Are you a Christian? Said, yes, of course. And you? Yes, I'm also a Christian. Okay. Then this person is walking towards closer and closer to him says, so which Christian are you? So he says, uh, Catholic or Protestant? So he said, in Christianity that means, I'm a Protestant. Oh, okay. Which Protestant are you? He says, I'm a Methodist. Oh, I'm a Baptist. Good, I'm also a Baptist. Which Baptist are you? So he says, I'm a Southern Baptist. Oh, good, I'm also a Southern Baptist. Which Southern Baptist are you? He says, I'm a Reformed Southern Baptist. Jump down and die, you faithless person. <laughs> <laughs> so, the idea is that in, in Baptist, Baptist is a group in Christianity, in Protestants. So, among Baptists, there's a, there's a traditional Baptist and Reformed Baptist, they call it. Orthodox Baptist and uh, Reformed Baptist. And the Reformed Baptist, they have made some adjustments according to time, place, and purpose. So Orthodox say that all those adjustments are deviations. And they are all good. So every Christian denomination thinks that, any not every, many, they think that anybody is not following our particular way of Christianity, they're going to go to hell. So, fanaticism, it has really very little to do with religion. It's a tamasic mentality imposed on religion. That tamasic mentality can come anywhere. It can come, like I talk, in the abortion it can come. In communism, that also has tamasic mentality. Anybody who opposes the state, that person is evil and that person should be killed. In the communism, the idea was 
that anybody who has got wealth, that person must have exploited and manipulated people, that's why they have got wealth. That's possible, but it's also possible that that, pe those, that person is talented, that person is committed, and they've earned the money, isn't it? But their idea is all wealthy people are evil. So in Ukraine, what they did was under communism, all the wealthy farmers were there, the mobs pounced on them and killed them, or just sent them off as, as prisoners to Siberia. And the government supported it. And then this happened in the 1920s. Of the 90, uh, late 1920s. So eventually, what resulted was one of the biggest fa famines. Because the people who got all those farms, they were neither expert nor hard work. Hard work. And farming is not simple. If you're not ready to work hard, you don't know what to plan when. And all these committed people were just talented, committed people were either killed or imprisoned. And the result was devastation. So to equate wealth, can wealth come because of exploitation? Of course it can come. But does that mean all wealth has come because of exploitation? No. So, to equate one thing with everything, that can be done by anyone. So, nowadays there's a whole specter of religious violence, and that is true. But communism was atheistic. And communism in China and Russia, in China and USSR, actually without any wars, the government itself killed a hundred million people. The First World War and Second World War combined, the toll was probably about 30-40 million. So more than both of them combined there. It's horrible. So any ideology where a person becomes narrow-minded, this way is the only way. What works for, what my idea is the only idea. That is fanaticism. And it all comes with the Tamoguna. So Tamoguna has two different aspects, I'll tell you. Exclusivism, and extremism. So exclu exclusivism is in thought or ideas. My way is the only way. Only if you worship my God, then you are going to go to hell. No, only if you worship my God, you are going to go to heaven. And if you are not worshipping my God, you are going to go to hell. And thoughtful people only say, my God. If they hear such an idea. Isn't it? Now, Extremism takes what is the thoughts into action. Extremists are actually much kinder. They say, say anyway you are going to go to hell, so why delay it? <laughs> <laughs> so, this is, now we can ascribe it to religion, we can say this religion is fanatical and that religion is fanatical. Well, but that is a, that is a non-philosophical religion. Said philosophically, what we need to see is that, ex that this kind of fanaticism is the problem, and fanaticism is a result of phenomena. Now, I was in a uh, interfaith conference in Washington, where they were doing a lot of dialogues over there. Said in India, we are the majority religion, so we don't need feel, feel any need for support from anyone else. But in the Western world, we are the minority religion. So they were engaged in uh, many interfaith dialogues. So that we are also, if there is a problem, we get support of the larger faith community. So anyway, I was talking, after that I was talking with one Muslim cleric. And we had a nice discussion and he told me that it's easier for me to have meaningful discussions with moderates of other traditions than extremists of my own tradition. So, that was a very insightful statement I thought that in every tradition, there will be people in Sattva Guna, there are people in Rajva Guna, there are people in Tamoguna. In every group it will be there. That is just the nature. And quite often people in Rajva Guna will be more, people in Tamoguna will be there, people in Sattva Guna will be there. But the real question is, who are in power? If people in Sattva Guna are in power, or at least they have authority, they have influence, that is the best. Even if people in Rajva Guna are in power, that's also okay. But Rajva Guna, what happens is, I want, I want prosperity, maybe I want more than you. But we understand that in Rajaguna people don't want mutually assured destruction. If I try to destroy you, you will destroy me. At this need to end this war. So people don't Rajaguna at least, Rajaguna is not associated with constant wars. That is the moment. That's why I mentioned earlier that although there have been long wars going on, no one has used nuclear weapons to me. 
that's a good thing. So that's because there is at least that level of Tamagoda is not coming. Rajaguna is there, but Rajaguna at least has an instinct of preservation. If I try to destroy you, it's quite likely you'll destroy me. If not now, in future when you get strength. So to some extent, live and let it. Not because I like you, but because it's a fact of it. So the Tamoguna is very much active in this world. In terms of fanaticism, extremism, which can come in religious versions, which can come in non-religious versions also. In India itself, this leftist ideology is very, very widespread. And the leftist ideology, it holds that the essence of Hinduism is the discriminatory caste system. And there's one South Indian leftist leader. He said that he basically was stealing from an European leader who said something similar. He said India will not know peace till the last Kshatriya has been strangled with the intestines of the last Brahmana. So, can you imagine how much bitterness must be there in this? If they think that Kshatriyas and Brahmanas are the cause of exploitation of the lower castes. And therefore, every Kshatriya and every Brahmana should be killed. So, and these kind of ideologies are not not uncommon. You may have read a few months ago, there was one Tamil leader who said that Sanatan Dharma is like, like COVID. Okay, also. Malaria. Like malaria, like, like an infectious toxic disease. And then he was criticizing, he said, you know, I'm not criticizing all other Hindus. Sanatan Dharma is a discriminatory caste. Sanatan Dharma has so many different things to it. And yes, was the caste system discriminatory? Yes, it was terribly discriminatory at times. But discrimination is just an unfortunate fact of human nature. Wait, that discrimination had been so bad. How did the lower caste survive for so long? How did the... Why did the lower caste stay within Hinduism for so long? There are always so many options. You know, Buddhism and Jainism came thousands of years ago, almost two thousand years ago. 2000 years ago, Christianity, Islam are providing alternatives. The people are still getting something within the Vedic tradition. And if you consider discrimination was there, we see that in when the British went to America and Australia, there are natives living over there. The natives are practically being eliminated now. They're non-existent. There's just some reserves, like you have animals kept in zoos. So these, these natives live in certain reserve areas. It's just a tiny number. So the lower castes were never annihilated. In fact, nowadays, uh, we don't even use the word lower caste because that is considered the, the <coughs> a discriminatory word. So the non-Brahminical caste, that's the word that is used sometimes. But the point is, to reduce all Sanatan Dharma and its profundity and richness to what? To just the discriminatory caste system. And even within that, untouchable. So, this is what it is actually destroyed. It's a horrible thing to do. And this is not, actually speaking, if it had not been for politics, caste would have become largely an irrelevant factor in India after independence. But if political vote banks, they emphasize caste. Now, of course, caste is also considered in marriages. And that's, but that's more a matter of. It's not so a matter of discrimination as it is a tool used for judging compatibility. Now, whether it is a reliable tool or not, that's a different issue. But the idea is if somebody is born in the same caste, then it is likely that people feel that they, that, that those people who have similar values. But even inter-caste marriages are becoming very common uh, nowadays. So, to reduce all of this complexity to just this one thing, uh, in Silicon Valley, it happened that there was some Brahmin and Brahmin boss in an IT company. I think it was Google only. Google and one of the top companies. He had an employee who was a shooter. And nobody cares. I don't know. I mean, I was in engineering college. We didn't even know what was who's word. There was more of the regional consciousness and cost consciousness. Oh, this is a Bengali, this is South Indian, this is Maharashtra, this is Bihari. We had more regional groups than caste groups. Is it like that here also? I mean, how many people really know also which caste somebody is from? We don't really care so much. 
especially including an urban setting. So anyway, what happened was, this person complained. The Shudra, there's a, some promotion was there. And this employee, both of them are IT engineers, the Shudra complained that he did not promote me because I'm a Shudra. Mm -hmm. And it became a huge issue. See, the left-wing left -wing media has a lot of control in society. So they made a big issue, oh, casteism, the evil of India has come to the West. And this is how you know, they are trying to brand. There are some people are trying to brand Prabhupada like that. But this Swami Prabhupada, he wants to revive the discriminatory caste system all over the world. And Prabhupada wanted to restore one ashram. That is not very different. But anyway, so then they did some big investigation. And some simple facts were overlooked by the media. See, the person who was promoted instead of him by this, this Brahmana manager was also Shudra. <laughs> so, when he was not promoted, it was simply based on merit. There had no caste issue over there. But like knowledge and ignorance means you reduce everything. Oh, you didn't promote me? Because I am from this, this. And everybody jumps on that bandwagon and just creates problems. So the Tavasic consciousness can, can actually cause unnecessary disruption in families, in communities, in countries. And in that sense, Tamagona has to be avoided. So I'll summarize what we discussed today. We tried to do, we tried to understand the modes. Yesterday we said, understand the modes. So we said that we, Krishna described the modes, the gunas, not in terms of ontology, what they are, but much more in terms of functionality, what they do. So within that, we discussed a little bit about how each of these modes, they have their characteristics. So sattva is characterized by discernment. The senses are illuminated with knowledge. So in sattva, we are more concerned with the knowledge senses, knowledge acquiring senses, jnana indriyas. In Greece, that's what we consider as progress. Then we discussed about rajas. Rajas is characterized by Basically, too much desire and too much work. So, the good thing about Tamas is that these people are working, they are not just lazy. But, Krishna said this, because it's all excess, it leads to Dukkha. So, we we'll see in the West there is a lot of material progress, but at a mental level there is a lot of distress. So, here only working senses and at that level, what is the knowledge that you are acquiring that is discussed. So here, through knowledge senses, philosophy develops. Here, technology develops. And the last part we spent a lot of time on was Tamas. So now Tamas, we discussed, it can be three levels. Agyana, Moha, Pramada. And so Agyana is I don't know. Prama, Moha is I think I know. And Pramada is I am certain that I know what is it. So, then we discussed as example of Pramad, intelligence in Tamas, knowledge in Tamas, both of these. So, what is it? Where a person arrives at conclusions opposite to what is real. So, I discussed how abortion is seen as technological liberation. Like, this is such a Tamasic way of looking at things. Then we discuss also, so this is, you could say, materialism. In materialism, then in communism, wealth is seen as equated with exploitation. Anybody who's gone wealth, they must have exploited it. So communism, it is said, they, they claim that they are having compassion towards the poor. That's why you should take wealth from the wealthy and give it all to the poor, distributed equally. But what they have is not compassion towards the poor, it's more envy towards the wealthy. And what happens in communism is that those who are going to redistribute the wealth, we will take wealth from the wealthy and give it to the poor. Those who are going to redistribute the wealth, they keep a lot of the wealth. And that's why there's one social commentary that says, communism, all people are equal, but some are more equal than others. <laughs> And then we can talk about how this can happen within religion also. Where what works for me is the only thing that works for everyone else. Fanaticism, we discussed that can be exclusivism in thought. 
and extremism yeah. in action. So it is Tamoguna, especially not just you know the passive madness, but Tamoguna when it uses the intelligence, when it uses knowledge for a pharmacy end. That's why the gunas is determined not just by the act activity, but primarily by the mentality. So Tamoguna is not just laziness and illusion. A person who is just spending all day watching TV and just sitting on potato, sitting on coach, coach and eating potato chips and becoming like a coach potato. <laughs> no, that person is tamasic, but that person is only destroying themselves. But a person who has tamasic ideology, that means they have, they have intelligence, they have knowledge, then they are using their intelligence for tamasic purposes. That kind of people are very dangerous. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Let's take one or two before we finish. Yes, please. Guruji, I have one question. Um, Can I have some water, please? Yeah, let's go ahead. Guruji, is uh, food also in a uh, farm cigarette, grass, sick, and uh, heartbeat? And uh, like, can the same food act differently for different people? Like, well, it depends on three things. You can say certain foods have intrinsically certain qualities. But it also depends on the quantity of the food they eat. So, some food may be sattvic. If somebody eats it too much, then that can that excessive eating can be Rajasuka or even Tamasik. So, Ati Sarvatra Vajayit. So, we can say the guna of food, guna of anna, is determined by which food it is, by how much it is eaten, and also where means it does with what kind of people, in what context it is eaten. That can also determine. So, somebody can eat, maybe they are eating just nice natural food, but it's in a tamasic environment. Mm -hmm. Tamasic environment will give a tamasic influence to that food. So it depends on all these factors. So sometimes we may take it for sad, but we might just be gulping it down, gulping it down. So that mode of eating can be tamasic. Yes, please. The time when we are learning something, so is there, how can we check and balance that we are not developing our knowledge in ignorance directly? We are not going to the world of ignorance by reading any particular even scriptures for that. Yes, it's a valid concern. Generally, That danger is always there when somebody is getting uh, religious education or spiritual education that they can become very self-righteous and my way is the only way. So Prabhupada was quite careful about that. Prabhupada did say that, <coughs> that he said ultimately our criteria is love of God. So when Christians ask Prabhupada, what do you think about Jesus? Prabhupada said, he's a guru who is ready to give up his life for the service of God. Such a person has so much love, the person whom we can learn from. So he's a guru. So Prabhupada was quite devout in that. So the idea is that we, based on our particular mood, may gravitate even within Shastra on certain sections of Shastra. So, I know devotees, I talk with them and they say, you know, oh, this kind of statement Prabhupada only made for PR purposes. Actually, one cannot go back to Jesus, through Jesus, go back to God to Jesus. It's only by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It is, some devotees say, you will not go back to Krishna, even if you are worshipping Narayana, you will not go back to the scripture where you are worshipping Narayana, you are worshipping, uh, worshipping Ram. Which is, which is preposterous in that domain. That's not our philosophy. 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he has both examples. There were followers of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And then in South India, too, there's one devotee, the Ram Bhakta, he's chanting Ram names by the influence of Mahaprabhu, Sarah chanting Krishna's names. There's another devotee, the Ram Bhakta, and he was in great agony that how could Ravan even touch Sita? Sita is the goddess of fortune. And then Mahaprabhu was so touched by him. Mahaprabhu, in his later traveling, he found a Purana and Jesus story was given about how. Actually, what Ravan took was not Sita but Maya Sita. And Mahaprabhu went back with that, with a copy of that Purana to show it to him and to pass it. He didn't tell him, oh, you are worshipping Ram, that is wrong. You should worship Krishna. Hmm. So, there is a lot of broad mindedness. There are many broad minded realities in our tradition. But sometimes, if we are in a particular mode, we will go towards those statements which resonate with our mood. And by that, what happens is we can come up with narrow mind. So, in the first generation of our movement, we have many exalted devotees as leaders. But there are also some people who came from, say, a Christian background. And they basically replaced Jesus with Prabhupada. So Jesus is the only way, Prabhupada is the only way. So, that is a danger that is everywhere. We have to be aware of that danger. So, in general, if we look at the overall body of Srila Prabhupada's teachings and of Yastri teachings. Krishna doesn't say, my way is the only way. He says, Mama Vartman Vartante, Manushyaha Pahad Sarvaj. All people are on my path, Krishna says. But Krishna says, Sarva Dharma Adhrata Ji, Maam Ekam Sharnam Vraja. But Maam Ekam Sharnam Vraja is more that focus on love of God. It is not necessarily focus on a particular path to love of God. Krishna is saying religious rituals are not as important as love of God in that particular context. So I would say that uh, one of our principles is Amanina Amanadena. So if we are becoming very self-righteous, you know, there are two things. There is being self-righteous means I am right and you are wrong. Not only I am right and you are wrong, I am good and you are bad. There is another word is self-congratulatory. Self-congratulatory means what? Like, I am also patting myself, shabash, shabash, how good you are, how good you are, you are such a wonderful person. So people who are self-congratulatory, they are quite easy to go to a tamopan. So now, we want to have confidence that the path we are following is right. And then of course we should cultivate the confidence. But the point is, we need to understand that Krishna is not the property of his God. Krishna is not the property of any religious group. All religions are meant for God. God is not meant for any religion, particular religion. God is far bigger than the religions and the religious paths that we pursue. So once we have that understanding, then we can have that attitude of humility. Aman, Okay? Good question. Any last question? Yes, please. How do we preach to simple confident Polish? How do we preach to super confident Polish? Or more better, how do we talk to them because they want penance? Yeah, I think we have to let them learn first from the school of hard knocks. The school of hard knocks of life itself. So, generally speaking, people need to have some receptivity. That's why at least in my Western outreach, I found people who are atheists actually are more receptive than people who are, say, Christians. Not all Christians. There are Christians also, Sadhu Maharaj, some Sattvic Christians I've seen. I've hardly seen any Sattvic Christian in India. I'm not saying they're not there. But what happens in India, they often, if they have converted now or they converted previously, then they are like defensive, aggressive about their faith. They are not introspective. And that's why it's very difficult to have a meaningful dialogue. So I have met Sattvic Christians also. But in general, the Christians on the streets, if you meet them, if they are evangelical, then it's uh, it's more fruitful to talk with a wall than to talk with them. That thing just goes into the head. <laughs> of course, at least we can talk with them. 
if you go to Islamic countries, you cannot even talk with them. So we have a, we have a lot of devotees in the Middle East, but it is all our bhakti practices in the Middle East are private. And inside our room, devotees do the over there. Ratyatra, they will hire the biggest hall in the country and indoors we have Ratyatra. No public practice of any religion other than Islam is allowed. So if people are very convinced about their way, then it's just best that we let it go. There's not much, much point in talking with them. Basically, like I mentioned yesterday, that we have to find something of interest. This is scripture. Remember the diagram I told you audience interest. So if the audience only interest is in proving that we are wrong. See, fanatical Christians, they don't just think that that fanatical Christians are fanatical Muslims. They don't just think that we are going to go to hell. They in fact consider that all other gods they don't consider, we may say Krishna and Christ are the same thing. Krishna and Christ and Allah are the same thing. They say, no, Allah is the only true God. And all other gods, we consider all other gods are false gods. False god means they are the shaitan, the Satan who is pretending to be God. And that's why they have this whole history of destroying temples and the security deities. Because their idea is that for the glory of the one true God to be established, all false gods are to be destroyed. And they, according to them, at least according to Islam, I don't know about Christianity, there is a special hell reserved for those who are preachers of false gods. <laughs> so, it's very difficult. If somebody is really very convinced about their way, then just be polite with them and let them go their way. Who knows, later on, they may become more open. Generally, whenever we are engaging with anyone, we have to think what is the purpose of the engagement. If that person is only going to become more aggressive and antagonistic, then there is not much use of engagement. So, in tomorrow's session, we will, so yesterday, uh, Guna's discussion was much more at a conceptual level, today it was much more at a sociological level. Uh, tomorrow we will discuss at a more personal and psychological level. You know, how the Gunas affect us and how can we move forward from the effect of the lower modes towards the higher modes. Thank you very much. Shrimad Bhagavad Gita ki, Shrimad Prabhupada ki, Gaur Bhaktavinda ki, Tai Gaur Prima.